Uh, we're joined today with Paul Wheeler. He is the Unmanned Aircraft Systems Program Manager for the Utah Department of Transportation. Um, really ex excited to have him here and to talk uh, a little bit about what's going on in the state of Utah. Um, you know, Paul, you gave us a brief introduction at the beginning um, beginning of this podcast, but if you could just jump back in and, and tell us a little bit about, um, about your career, how you, how you made your way into the drone industry, and then uh, you know what um, kind of what your day job uh, looks like now. Um, before and, and post COVID. Yeah, sure thing. So like I said, my background's probably started from my dad. He he always took me to air shows and gave me a love for aviation. And that's where it really started. And from that I got into RC aircraft or even flying, you know, an airplane with a stick or not a stick, a string hooked to it. You know, remember those old ones? So from there I learned how to fly RC stuff, went to helicopters. And then where it really started with the Department of Transportation is I started seeing the technology get better and I, I knew about flying it, but there wasn't the sensor piece to it. We were flying gliders or other things, finding winds and, and having fun. But uh, we had a project with our Utah State University where they built up a UAS and put sensors on it. I went to look at it and it was home build. It was with duct tape and everything else. And do you remember in school, do you guys ever make those rubber band chains, the big yeah, thick yeah. ones? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they had one of those to launch this, right? And I'm out in the field. I'm like, this is going to fail. You know, <laughs> I'm waiting for it to tank into the ground. But they launched it up in the air. It flew and it had automation and it, it did what it wanted to. They had it hooked to, you know, a digital SLR. They had some um, multispectral cameras and other things on it. And really it was about the data. And that's where I'm like, wow, this is really viable. This, this could happen. And fast forward up to 2016, when technology started getting better, you started seeing more drones come into it with better sensors. I think that was the key. And at that point, we really says, okay, it might be time to jump into this. So since I was already a pilot, we could do the Section 333. I started down that path, but then, as we all know, Part 107 came out. So, and then we seen everything exploding. So I was able to... Uh, Luckily, test my job at that time was to just test out new technologies. And I was like, oh, where do I sign up? You know, let me try this out. <laughs> Absolutely. I've got the experience to fly these and let's see what they can do. So we started just testing out different little use cases to see what was possible. We started with surveying, started with bridge inspection, started with other things and seen so many savings in and how easy it was to do some of the jobs and how much time we were saving instead of setting up traffic control we weren't impeding traffic so we would use it for little things to really large things and everything we tried it on worked great i mean we have some limitations obviously we can't fly over traffic and other things but mm -hmm. but what we are seeing is significant savings in the cost of it and not only that the safety factor uh, unfortunately if you know the statistics on there one of the first responders dies about every week in our country from being out on the roadway and it's just not safe to stand on the road. I started my career out as a surveyor at the Department of Transportation, and you're right there on the road, and yeah. semi-trucks are flipping rocks at you and everything else. If you right. think it's bad on a windshield when one hits, it tries standing out there. Yes. But uh, <laughs> when uh, if you can get out of that environment and still collect the data that you need, that's what really is a game changer for this. And not only that, some of the surveys that we're doing on cliffs, if you've ever been to Utah, it's not flat here. Right. We've got mountains, we've got big cliffs, red rocks, and try and go survey some of that stuff. When you've got a 500-foot cliff, it's not easy to be like, oh, okay, you're just going to go take some shots up there for a survey, right? It's, um, it's a whole-day event, if you can even get there, where you can fly a drone and let it map those areas automatically for you, and you're getting better data than what we've ever been able to get. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's kind of the piece of that. But what it did is since that grew so exponentially in what we could do, they seen the benefit of that. And we created a whole UAS program from that. So it wasn't just uh, in the beginning. It's like what even uh, iPhones and other things were. People are like, oh, it's just a toy. And same thing, I bet you've all seen it with uh, the drones or the UAS. They're like, oh, it's just a toy. Why, why are we going to spend money on toys? But when they seen what the sensors that are attached to those can do, that's what really changed it and the quality of the data that we could achieve and the ease of use. If you could train somebody to, to fly them really easily, that's the key as well. It wasn't very hard. The software is good. And that's what really changed things on there for us. And now if you fast forward, I mean, 2016, we started, we had four of them testing. Fast forward to today, we've got 41 drones in our fleet. Wow. We've got 35 remote pilots and they're out there flying and collecting data. 
So, and that's just in the the DOT. If you're looking at our our law enforcement, highway patrol, they've got about that same amount. Our natural resources, our mining districts, other ones are using them too. Imagine trying to to survey some of these open pit areas, and when you walk on it, it changes, right? When you're trying to get a shot and it's not always easy on those slopes, but you can fly them and you're not impacting it whatsoever mm-hmm. and you're getting better data. It's more dense data. So that's where it really comes to play for us. And we see it growing, growing more in the future. Fast forward to the, the UAM side, that's uh, going to be a huge play too, because as you know, all the cities are getting more and more congested. Traffic's an issue. So how can we combat that? That's mm-hmm. uh, the other piece. So we had uh, Talinda Larson on not that long ago. So we're we're familiar with um, you know the great work that Utah is doing in the UAS industry. But can you talk a little bit more about um, you know personal successes that y- you've had? Um, just like w- what are what are kind of some of your most proud drone moments from Utah? So one of them, I'd say overhead sign inspections. It sounds pretty lame, but uh, <laughs> as you know, the the overhead signs that you go over, they need inspected. So with that comes to play, they have to shut down traffic. Does anybody like being stuck in construction or when the traffic lanes close down? Absolutely not. So by utilizing UAS and flying it off to the side of the highway and using a zoom lens, you can zoom in and see all the rivets, all the bolts. So on one project there in Salt Lake City we did on SR201, we saved over $100,000 on that one project alone using oh, UAS versus amazing. traditional methods. So they were only able to do typically two to three signs. They'd close down the road. They'd have to do it at night because they didn't want to impact traffic as much. So they get two to three signs trying to crawl around in a bucket truck, trying to inspect every rivet. Yeah. But now we can do it during the day. We're not impacting traffic whatsoever. And just one job alone saved over $100,000. By wow. using drones. So that was a really cool. When I seen that type of money being saved, that was amazing. Uh, or as I mentioned, even surveying, we uh, using LIDAR. We have LIDAR on our UAS as well. And this is down in Bryce Canyon. If anybody's been to that national park down there, we're looking at realigning the road. We had some landslides down there. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot of hilly area. And it would have taken them about a month and a half to survey that traditionally to get a, a ground topo. And we we're able to fly it with the LIDAR in one day. One day, we saved a month and a half of time. I mean, you got the processing and everything else, but you're talking three or four days yeah. of time versus a month and a half. And not only that, we're getting a lot better data out of it because it's a lot more dense. So that's uh, and that's plus the platform thing. is expandable or it's extensible. So that's what we can do today. But now that we're we're using drones, you know, we could figure out new sensors or layering of sensors or higher resolution data or figuring out ways to interpolate between multispectral and infrared that yield better results, right? So all of that is just an added bonus. Yeah, absolutely. In other areas like in our incident management, if you've seen the incident management trucks that are out there helping people, we have a drone on every one of those now. And cool. for that, that's say like we have uh, an accident with a serious or, or fatality, and sometimes the road's closed for four hours while they survey that scene. We can get it open in about a fourth of the time by using UAS to map it. Then there's no question what happened on the scene. Or here's another scenario. We we had something happen like this not too long ago is someone was um, – there's a bad accident. They didn't know how many people were in the vehicle. Now, put yourself in this place. You get in an accident. You're ejected from a vehicle, and you're thrown into an area with a lot of vegetation. This particular area was full of spiders. So nobody wanted to walk into it. There's just spider webs everywhere and spiders and the, the highway patrol. And people were like, oh, we don't want to walk through there, but we need to find the person. We were able to get our UAS up in the air, use thermal, and search that area and come to find out there wasn't anybody there, luckily. But uh, imagine if you were the person laying there waiting to get helped and nobody knew you were there and you're waiting for somebody to walk through all that to find you, where if you were able to find them with thermal and get the help to them, you could easily save somebody's life. Yeah. So I have to ask, you know, now you've seen so much success and, and so much clear success. It seems like no one can deny that drones in this use case are brilliant. But was it always like that? And what, especially in the beginning, did it take to convince the government to adopt drones? Right. No, it wasn't like that. As I mentioned, it was like, oh, you want to play with a toy, right? Right, right. And uh, 
and then you'd say, okay, well, I got this. Let's see what it can do. And they'd be like, oh, it can't, it can't do this job. So we actually had some fun competitions and be like, okay, you do it your way. I'll do it my way. And let's see who gets done faster. But where it really came down to play is when you get them the data and show them what you're able to achieve. That's when it was a game changer. So that's when you've seen like the light bulb come on. You just being like, I'm going to use this drone. I'm going to fly it. I'm going to do it or yeah. you know, get permission. <laughs> so what I would do is I'd go to the different areas and I'd just say, hey, what are you guys going to go do today? And learn about their things. And one instance was in our maintenance division, they had to go inspect fence. And he was just complaining about it. He's like, oh, I'm going to have to go and climb up and down these slopes. Again, the mountainous area, right? And uh, there might be wood ticks out there and other things he's going to have to deal with. So he was going to take all day to walk up and down the slope to just inspect fence. Pretty boring job. I says, hey, uh, why don't we test it with a drone? Mm -hmm. So I was able to fly the drone 12 miles an hour, a lot faster than anybody can hike. Right. Get it done in, you know, an hour, a little over an hour we flew it. And they've got video documentation. And they're like, here you go. Next thing they're like, we're going to buy a drone. Yeah. <laughs> so. Right. But it sounds like it really took you just saying, like, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm not going to ask for permission, really. <laughs> it, yeah. it just, someone needs to be there and say we're doing this. Yeah, luckily, it's uh, they give us a lot of leeway in Utah. And I really got a hand to our management for this is they let us try things. And we have a, an area where they're saying it's okay to fail sometimes if as long as we learn from it. So that's why we're able to test certain things out. And with that, they said, go see what we can do with it. And that, that's why I was able to do that. And people are more receptive to say, okay, well, let's try it. And you, know, and you get the, the people like, yeah, yeah, right. This little toy is not going to be able to do it. And then when you bring back that data, they're just amazed. Like, wow, yeah. I can't believe you just did that or collected that. And when they look at a point cloud from the data or just even the imagery of your bolts and other things, that's, that's where it really shines. And then fast forward to today, we're looking at using machine learning and AI incorporated with that. So I talked about that overhead sign inspections, right? Yeah. Well, the piece I didn't talk about was they got the video, they got everything else. We saved that that over $100,000. But the poor soul that had to be in the office watching the video of every of it, right? The structure inspector. I'm like, I'm sorry. He's like, yeah, you can tell who's been flying because who was stable, who was zooming in and out trying to make him sick. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that was the next piece. I said, let's let's see what we can do. So we're looking at using machine learning to let it do it to help mm -hmm. save our poor structure inspector. So he'll train it once or twice to get that computer model going. And then let's let the computers figure out where the missing rivets are or any bolts and stuff and use technology to do that instead and, and get even more efficiencies from it. And then our poor guy in the office isn't motion sick and everybody's wondering, why is that guy throwing up over there, right? <laughs> He's doing the rib inspection. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Whose turn is it this week? <laughs> um, so, so Paul, I have to ask you, you have a team of, you know, three dozen drone pilots, it sounds like. What does it take to get that job? Because I know so many readers come to me and say, my dream job is drone pilot. What do I do? So I ask you for a friend. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. What I would say first is get your license, right? Get your part 107 license and then start flying because there's a lot of different areas to go. And that's that's the key. We're a little different in Utah and some of my, my peers are the same way. And that we don't just do the part 107 though, but we also have practical requirements. So mm -hmm. I make all of my pilots go through practical classes and show that they can actually fly. And then we've got different classes. We've got a basic class just to make sure that they can actually fly. We do obstacle courses, other things. Emergency procedures are big in that. So I'll put the drone in the sky and not let them look at their tablet and be like, find it. So I'll have them turn around while I fly it out and say, I want you to be able to find it in the sky and fly it back mm -hmm. without looking at anything. That way they get used to the controls, how they change, and what happens if your tablet goes dead. So that's uh, kind of those key pieces, learn those practical skills. And then you get the more advanced ones. So like obviously bridge inspection is going to take a lot more skill than just doing mapping when you're mm -hmm. just doing the automation software. But to get into it, I'd say start flying, get your license, just get a little bit of experience. And then that's kind of what you need. Uh, we've got all the, the pilots, but some of them, it's secondary to their duties. They just volunteered and wanted to, to mm. use these because they see the value in them. Like our fun. structure, it is fun. It's absolutely fun. When people hear that uh, that's what you get to do for your job and you actually get paid for it, they're like, yeah, where do I sign up? Right. <laughs> 
and you're seeing more and more jobs come out of this industry because of that. I'm sure all of you are seeing that. It's uh, It's been great. And I think in the future, we're going to see even more. So, yeah. um, what uh, Are there any u- unique challenges that governments face um, when it comes to implementing a drone program? And I guess, do you have any advice for somebody maybe in your shoes who wants to implement a drone program, but um, you know, it just doesn't really know where to start or they're, or they're looking into the technology and trying to figure out where they can see some savings and where they can get value? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say one of the most unique challenges that all we have, all of us have, is perception. Right? That's what we were talking about earlier. Is let's get that positive perception out there because when people hear you're buying drones, first thing they think is, oh, they're spying on us, right? But, or they're just going to be doing something stupid. But if we can get that perception about what it really does and how we we can save time, money, lives, all that, that's the key. And if you're just getting ready to start a drone program, I'd say, look at what your real requirements are. People want to just go out and buy a drone and they buy the horrible drone that's not going to give them what they want. Mm -hmm. So first of all, figure out what you need to do with it, right? Say, okay, this is my goal. This is my ultimate goal. Then start looking at what you need to meet that goal. So what sensor? That should be the next question is what sensor do I need to obtain this? And then look at what drone can handle that. So maybe you need LIDAR, maybe you don't. Maybe you can get away with a a cheaper drone. But I'd say look at aircraft that have a good record, that they're really easy to use. And not just easy to use, but uh, you also have software compatibility. That's been a big piece for us is the software compatibility of some of these. And don't always trust marketing hype too, because you'll hear that this thing can do everything in the world and then you get it and it can hardly do anything that you absolutely need it to do. Maybe it can do everything indoors, but the second you get it into wind, it's worthless, right? So, or how long do the batteries last? So if they're they're trying to, to get into that program, really look at what their goal is and what they're trying to achieve. And also look at what budget they have and also what limitations because procurement's another thing. In in government, there's a lot of red tape and checks and balances. So by knowing how to get through your procurement cycle is another one. There's some great resources out there. So federal highways under their Everyday Counts 5 initiative, I sit on that committee. They've got a lot of great webinars and information that myself and a lot of my colleagues have been sharing. James Gray's heading that. That's a great resource too. I was on a committee for a domestic scan for NCHRP, and they actually created a document if you're looking to get started. It's called Successful Approaches for the Use of Unmanned Aerial Systems by Surface Transportation Agencies, and it goes through all that. So that's a document that's out there. It's uh, NCHRP 20-68A or 17-01's report. So that's uh, a way to get started too. But um, what I really like to tell people is you don't have to start and spend a lot of money. I mean, you're talking, you can get a high quality drone for $1,500. By the time you probably want to buy some batteries, get probably four batteries, you know, get an iPad, get a good case for it. You're $2,500 and you can have a very viable drone program. You don't have to spend a lot of money. That will come with time as you build your fleet. But just to get started, you'd be amazed what you can do with some of these lower cost drones. You can do live streaming, and get the data back to whoever needs to see it. You can do mapping, you can do surveying, you can do a lot of these things that I'm talking about with a lower cost UAS. So that's uh, the thing I like to tell too, and just just really start by what your goal is and and go backwards. Yeah, you guys primarily flying like $1,500 drones? Is it DJI drones? What are you guys flying? Yeah, yeah, the majority of us are. We have a diversified fleet, so Mm -hmm. the majority of them are DJI and the reason why is because those were the ones that were working the best at the time. They had the best software capability. And it took me a long time to find a good piece of software that I could use that actually did the terrain following because Utah isn't flat. Some of the software that just is based off your home point doesn't work for me because it will run right into a cliff unless I'm flying from the top of the cliff and then suddenly the ground sampling distance changes. So I need a software that will follow terrain when I'm mapping. That way it's following that consistent height above the ground. Mm -hmm. So that was a a key piece too for us is to find the right software that would integrate with that to make that work or else our maps just weren't very good quality. Also being able to set ground control points and other things. So that's, that's where it goes. But we can do all that with that lower cost drones. Now, if we're getting into areas with a lot of vegetation and we need to 
get data in there. So if you can imagine the old way, some of it was so thick. And I don't know if you know what Russian olives are, but it's the nastiest tree on earth, I believe. It's got <laughs> thorns that are about two inches long. And if they scratch you, it burns for days. I mean, I, when I was first serving through that stuff, uh, I came out bloody and painful and everyone was laughing at me. But it's, it's not a fun thing, right? Yeah. But if you can do it with a drone or with LiDAR and let it fly it and get the data, it's much better. Instead of having somebody crawl on their hands and knees through this stuff, trying to get a shot with a GPS when they can't see the sky so they don't get a signal. With LiDAR, it can actually get through a lot of that vegetation. So if that's what you're needing to do, you might need to spend a little bit more money. But a lot of times to get started, you don't. You can do it with those lower cost drones. And that's the majority of our fleet really is those. We have some lower cost, we have mid-range, and then obviously the higher end ones. But that's because what grew over time for what we needed for our goals, we found out what we could do with the lower cost ones. And then when it didn't meet it, we'd try and see what sensor would meet those needs. Awesome. Yeah, kind of debunking some of uh, some of the myths that that may be holding somebody people up um, <clears throat> when it comes to implementing a program. So, yeah, the other thing I'd say too on there is, uh, as I mentioned, the marketing hype. Understand what the real limitations are on that drone, <laughs> of, and these are all from personal experiences of me flying yeah. them out there. We were doing a bridge inspection, and we had a really high bridge, 400 foot drop, right? And uh, in the morning, it was great. Everything was going fine. I'm flying. Everything's awesome. And then the winds pick up. And uh, luckily, I always save some battery just in case of emergencies. I don't take it to the end. So I was bringing it back when those winds came up. And here it is, like 10 feet away from me. If you can imagine a picture, here I am standing on a cliff. The drone's 15 feet away from me off the cliff. I'm full throttle. You can hear the motors, and it's not moving. And I'm just watching the battery level go down. And uh, this was one of those ones that cost like about $40,000, right? This is an expensive one. Wow. And and here I am panicking because it's like, uh, you know, some of it's made in flights. I'm like, this is not going to be a good day. And it would take me hours to get down to the bottom to even collect this thing. And uh, here I'm like, oh, this was supposed to handle winds higher than this. But here we are. (laughs) So luckily the wind gusts died down and I had enough battery because of that reserve to get it safely back to me. But boy, it was a stressful moment for me. And I'm like, oh no, this isn't cool. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe I got to take it to the other side of the bridge and, and land it over there. You know, it's uh, things to think about when you're doing it. Get your policy and procedures. And in that, make sure you got emergencies in there too. Plan for those. I mean, you hope nothing bad's going to happen, but train on it and make sure that's not the first time that you've trained because you want to be ready for it and not be like, oh, now what do I do? If you're already prepared, you've already trained on that, it's uh, it's a non-factor as much, right? Because you're already ready for that. So that's another piece I'd say. When you're getting a drone program, make sure you get that. Make sure you get some policy and procedures down and train people the proper way. Mm. So, yeah. But how do you test for that that circumstance? Uh, and and yeah, you know, how, do, how do you vet the marketing? That's another thing. Because I have to say in the drone industry, um, maybe because it's emerging tech, there's a lot of overpromising that happens, um, so it, it seems harder to kind of get the right answer, even from well-established manufacturers, uh, because they kind of always want to say yes, this is good for that circumstance. Yeah, yeah, that that's that's a very good point. And in the beginning, nobody else was really doing it, so I had to test that. And unfortunately, yeah. you know, that's that's the way it was. But now I'd say talk to people. A lot of people are using these now that are out there, so there there's some information you can talk to those who have it. Or if you can't, have the manufacturer come out and demonstrate it on site. That's another thing, especially when you get in the more expensive ones, because they may promise the moon, but then when you actually get some of that data, it may not be what they promised. So mm-hmm. I'd say have them come out and demonstrate that it can do what you need it to do. And if they don't want to do that, then that may not be the platform you want to use. Right, that's a, that's a sign. So uh, you're kind of an expert on UAS policy. So what are the the kind of most important things that you'd like to see from drone policy over the next year or so? Maybe even two years. Sure. Yeah, I see remote ID being that really big milestone for everything to integrate together. So next to that, I see BV loss, flights over people, and then also over moving vehicles is kind of a big milestone. Obviously, we need to get the redundancy and safety out there because there's just not a lot of data for it yet. It's getting more and more, and I think that's that's good. But on the policy standpoint, those are the, the big things that's holding everybody back. And 
a lot of those, I mean, there's a lot of obstacles to, to get that to happen safety, but everybody's moving towards that. And as we mentioned before, aviation really has that amazing safety record and we want to keep that good record of safety, right? With anything that's in the air. So I think really the, the big issues right there is defining the airspace too and how all the UAS operations, including package delivery, aerial passenger vehicles, how all that's going to integrate together. And really what I think key is too is it's really important to, to get it right this time and learn from our past transportation mistakes that we've we've made in the past, right? So as I mentioned before, we're kind of working on that simulator with University of Utah to, to help answer some of those questions and see what happens with, as I mentioned, the vertiport in one area versus another area, or what does it look like with highways in the sky? How do you get a, an aerial vehicle or an aerial taxi with passengers on it up through the package delivery layer safely? How do those intersections work in the sky? And that's really what we're we're working towards. And what I see is the next thing that really needs to happen policy-wise and, and decide how that's going to work too. Are they going to let states help control the national airspace locally? Is it all going to be on the federal level? We obviously need that same federated system for a UTM to make it work, but but who's going to control it locally? It seems like a, a daunting task for everything that happens within a city to be done on a federal level. So it may be a better place for states to help step in like they do with their local traffic operation centers. Maybe it's an aerial traffic operation center that helps that way. We're not exactly sure. We've, we've heard a lot of talk about that possibly happening, and it's not been decided yet, but I see that as, as being one area that the states could help and maybe good at that because they'll know what's happening locally in their community maybe better than than someone else so it's uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens but i think those are the keys that really need to happen policy wise to, to make this happen well any any final thoughts uh paul before we we let you go and and then how can people get in touch if they want to ask any questions and just learn more about the great work you guys are doing in utah sure yeah i know i just appreciate you guys having me on it's great uh talking with sally and and everyone here Learn what everybody's doing. It's exciting for me. Uh, as far as getting in touch with me, uh, you're welcome to, to email me at pwheeler at utah.gov. You can uh, look at our website at utah.gov. Uh, there's a lot of information out there of what's going on through federal highways and other things of what my peers and other states and I are doing. There's there's some amazing things going on right now. If you look at uh, what North Carolina is doing, Ohio, New Jersey, all I mean, states all across, Alaska. I mean, I could name all the states and they're doing great stuff right now. And there's a lot of information. Federal Highways has been doing really good to, to get that information out, as you guys are too. We've I've been to Interdrone a few times uh, and it's great what you guys are doing for the industry as well. So I commend you on that. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Sally, where, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at thedronegirl.com, on Twitter at thedronegirl and Instagram at thedronegirl. Awesome. We'll put all of that stuff in the uh, description below the podcast. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Sally, for, for joining us. Um, this podcast will be on uh, the Introdone website, SoundCloud, YouTube, Spotify, wherever pods are casted. So thanks again, everybody, and we'll see everybody next week.